the community-based Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood Workforce Strategy webinar. Today's call is being recorded. For opening remarks and introductions, I'd like to turn the conference over to Ms. Katerina Bumara, SSRC Products Task Lead and Training and Technical Assistance Manager at ICF International. Katerina, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to an introduction to the Community-Based Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood Workforce Strategy webinar. My name is Katerina Bumara and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is sponsored by the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. Before we begin, I will provide a brief overview of the SSRC. The Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is a virtual portal of research and other resources related to self-sufficiency. It functions as an online community for researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders interested in self-sufficiency, employment, and family and child well-being. The SSRC's purpose is to disseminate quality research. We currently have over 4,700 items in our library, and we are constantly adding new resources. The library's materials are organized into 12 topical areas that are listed on the right-hand side of your screen. Every item included in the library is reviewed for relevancy. Users may search by keyword or use filters like topic area, target population, geographic location, or research methodology to browse the collection. Every topic area page under the Browse Topics tab includes a Our Librarian Recommends box that highlights research and resources recommended by the SSRC library team. Each topical area page also includes relevant federal laws and regulations. Under the Stay Connected tab, you'll find entities involved in self-sufficiency research, a robust events calendar, and a list of organizations that have partnered with the SSRC to host events. Please visit this tab to access previous webinar recordings and additional materials. On the screen is a snapshot of the new Students' Corner and Professor's Place. Through these tabs, professors may access self-sufficiency-related course material and reading, and students may parse through the SSRC library resources to supplement their coursework, as well as explore learning opportunities within the self-sufficiency field. On the right side of your screen, you'll find some quick links to the SSRC. Select the title, and then click the Browse To button for those links to open in a new window. Moving on to today's webinar, our speakers today are Matthew Shepard, Community and Clinical Psychologist and Fellow at ICF International, Penny Tinsman, Senior Project Manager at ICF International, and again, I am Katerina Bamera, your moderator. Finally, we encourage you to join today's conversation on Twitter using the SSRC webinar hashtag displayed on the screen. Tweets using this hashtag will display on the left side of the webinar platform. And you can see a, a lot of people already have already been tweeting using the hashtag. Following the presentation, we will hold a question and answer session. You can submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom right of your screen, and we will address these questions during the Q&A session. I will now turn it over to Penny Tinsman for today's presentation. Hi there, good morning, um, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I wanted to start off by just giving a few um, brief uh, websites where you can find the information that you can see here, um, the Self-Sufficiency Clearinghouse uh, reference page, the Office, the Office of Family Assistance resource page where you will find the toolkit that we'll be describing today. As, and further, there's a, another toolkit regarding the Family Economic Stability Toolkit, which is also there on, um, the, um, on that website. We're going to get started today by talking a little bit about the poll. What we'd like to know from you um, is how familiar you are with the community-based healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood strategy. So please respond by either indicating not at all familiar, you understand it and have heard about it but don't really know a lot about it in, in, in detail, you're fairly familiar, or you're very familiar. Next 
exciting. We, we see a lot of folks seeming that they're not familiar with it at all or that they have heard about it um, but don't really know uh, a lot about it in detail. Okay, I'm going to um, move on to the next slide. I was having some technical difficulty there, my apologies. <clears throat> the Office of Family Assistance provides um, and supports healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood programs throughout the country. They are currently in a brand new set of grants that were just funded in October. So <clears throat> that's a very exciting time for, for, the, for OSA. And since 2006, the Office of Family Assistance has funded such organizations that would implement healthy marriage and fatherhood programs. The programs aim to improve the overall well-being of children and parents by helping participants build and sustain healthy relationships and marriages and to strengthen positive father-child interactions. However, however, economic stability has emerged as an increasingly important element for consideration in working toward the overall goal of family and father well-being. Workforce development strategies that focus and increase the skills and abilities of individuals to <clears throat> be successful in their local labor markets are an important element in building economic stability for families. In response to this need, OFA has begun placing a strong emphasis on, it, on integrating economic stability and workforce development activities and, and services into what has been traditionally offered to strengthen fathers and families. Many HMRF programs have relatively little or no experience in effectively implementing and integrating economic stability activities into their program models, and there is a lack of clear understanding <clears throat> of the key comp components required for an effective program. As such, the grantees required practical advice about how to implement, implement, excuse me, implement such activities. To provide this guidance, OSA undertook a process of research and investigation that has resulted in the development of the community-based healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood workforce strategies that we're going to discuss today. The Healthy Marriage Responsible Fatherhood grantees have the potential to develop into <coughs> effective providers of economic stability and workforce development services. The grantees must be provided information and models and tools that are based on research validated approaches and then can be tailored to the individual needs of each grantee. The workforce strategy that we're going to discuss today and then ultimately the workforce toolkit, which will be described by my colleague Matt Shepard, is built on an extensive review and refinement process and provides a framework for, <clears throat> for working with these high need and lesser skilled population. <clears throat> Basically, we initiated the, re the research for this um, strategy by developing and looking at a, the an enormous amount of literature that was available regarding workforce strategies for community-based organizations. We then developed a strategy and we took it on the road, if you will. We went and visited several um, fatherhood and marriage programs that did have an economic stability program component within the organization. And finally, after refi refining the model further, we vetted the information with a expert panel meeting in which um, both pra or practitioners, researchers, um, policy makers were brought together to really get their ideas, suggestions about how to, to make the, the strategy better. Um, the result of which is can be found in two conceptual tools. The conceptual model, which provides the convenient means to summarize the main components of the, <clears throat> of the framework. We, we lovingly refer to it as the diamond, um, and also the conceptual process map, which actually describes the path that one of the individual participants would be f taking through this, mo um, this model. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Matt Shepard, to walk us through the strategy and toolkit. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Matt Shepard, and as mentioned, I'm a fellow at ICF International and one of the authors of the Workforce Strategy and the toolkit that we'll be talking about today. And I just want to provide you a brief overview of the model and the information that you're going to find contained in the toolkit that you can find on the SSRC website. Uh, as Penny mentioned, the conceptual, the uh, workforce strategy, as I'm going to call it today for short, really can be described using kind of two visual aids. The first is the conceptual model that we call the diamond here, and the second is a process map. Um, the workforce strategy conceptual model was developed as a framework for understanding how programs, in this case, healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood programs, but this should be applicable to many programs, how a system of services can provide the needed services to participants to increase their economic stability and their family well-being. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's designed to enable organizations to maximize the impact they have through partnership to help specifically low-income, low, high-need individuals. Let's see if I can handle the technology here myself. So this is the uh, uh, process map, which really, again, provides a visual aid of how individual participants might go through the system. A single organization or service provider is not necessarily expected to have the capacity or the responsibility to provide the entire spectrum of services. Rather, such a system typically requires the engagement of a network of collaborating partnerships that, taken as a whole, provide access to all the supports that might be needed by participants. Likewise, individual participants are not necessarily going to need all the services that an integrated service system could provide, and each participant will have his or her own path toward economic stability that will utilize different partners depending on their own individual needs and strengths and weaknesses. Now going back to the workforce strategy, we're going to go through these one at a time. And each one of these module components uh, is represented in the toolkit by a separate chapter or module, as we call them. And so you can find detailed information on all of these aspects uh, in that toolkit. The first module I want to talk about is the intake and assessment um, module. And it covers things such as personal needs assessment, job and skills, experience assessments, and motivational interviewing. The intake baseline assessment process is the mechanism for establishing the baseline of a client's needs. You look at the personal skills and the job skills, determine what the appropriate needs are going to be and how to address those. It also presents an opportunity to assess the client's willingness and readiness to engage in a program and can help participants identify goals and develop a hopeful vision for the future. To do this, good interviewing skills are critical to this process, and they help put the client at ease and develop a focus on achievable goals and support the conditions for change. The second module in the toolkit is case management, the client plan, and supportive services. The case management, client plan, and supportive services together serve as the glue or the connection between all the other aspects of the model. They link clients to services and supports, and they monitor their progress. The concepts in the model or the framework are intended to function as a tailored network of support services that help individuals move towards economic stability rather than requiring participants to engage in a linear sequence of services that may not be relevant to their individual needs. Economic stability cannot be met through, one employ through employment alone, but through employment activities that are combined with supportive services and tailored towards the needs of individuals. The coordination of these services is the function of case management. The client plan then outlines, outlines the goals and services that are needed to accomplish what the client needs to move towards economic stability. And all of this hinges on the effective assessment of individual needs, as we just described in Module 1 with the intake and assessment. To ensure that appropriate services are delivered, the research indicates that the use of case management significantly impacts the sustainability of economic stability towards among low-income individuals. So uh, the, the gains that they uh, achieve throughout the model are only really sustainable with a, a, a effective case management process. Whatever the uh, specific approach that a program adopts in terms of a providing case management, through that be through case managers or job developers or someone with a different title, it's important that the, an individual service plan be developed that includes both short-term and long-term goals and that these plans are designed to move towards readiness and job placement. Um, case managers help their clients with interpersonal skills and coping skills 
And both of these things affect employability. So case management is the function of linking these services. The client plans is, tells you what those services will be. And to really make it effective, supportive services address all of those extra needs, such as transportation. Uh, it can include child care any kind of other needs or services that need to be addressed. And case managers can either address those things directly by themselves or address them through referrals to partnerships. The third module is capacity building. And capacity building really is at the heart of this economic stability model. Improving the capacity of the client or the participant to balance income and expenses and to also prepare them for the future by building their own personal and work skills, it's critical to move a family towards economic stability. It's these skills that equip participants with information and the personal and professional capacities that enable them to gain, retain, and advance in employment and acquire the financial reserves that are needed to cushion against economic uh, setbacks. And so as you can see, the capacity building module really focuses on a number of different aspects, including education about what to do with your money, the ability to save that money, and then I think very importantly, both interpersonal skills uh, and needs such as problem solving, critical thinking, conflict resolution, which are the aspects of a program that are typically provided by your standard healthy marriage or responsible fatherhood program or other social service programs that people may be aware of. But those also have direct uh, impact on the work environment, so your ability to get along with your spouse and improving that also improves your ability to get along with your employer. So, And the final aspect of that capacity building really is the ability to, be, to build job-specific technical skills, things such as you know, heating and air conditioning training or mechanics training or truck driving or some specific skill that helps them be more competitive in the job market and advance their career. Uh, the fourth module in the toolkit is about connecting to job openings. Uh, and there's an important distinction here between job development and job placement and the other things that you'll find in this category. Job development really focuses on the location and the development of job placement opportunities. So it is the process of finding an opportunity for someone to apply to. And this can be done at several different levels. It may include something as simple as looking in the newspaper to find a job opportunity or, or queuing your network to find if there's an opening someone can apply to. But it also, in many cases, involves much more detailed efforts, such as serving on community boards, working in partnership with employers to develop opportunities that may not have otherwise been there or that may not have been there for the, the population that you're interested in working with. Then child placement are the actual activities that are surrounding actually connecting that person to a specific job opportunity. And finally, transitional support are an array of services or supports that help individuals, particularly those individuals without a lot of job experience, gain some of that experience or at least get their foot in the door in terms of employment opportunities. And so things such as internships, apprenticeships, subsidized employment opportunities, and transitional programs, including sometimes working for a specific pro a program themselves and then gaining some job experience and then moving towards more of the competitive job market are all kind of examples of connecting to job openings. Uh, the final module in the toolkit is around work retention and career advancement. And these are strategies that are designed to sustain or advance individuals in their job and support the long-term labor market. Uh, uh, the, the, the components of this include incentives, ongoing support, and upskilling. And incentives can be incentives that are provided to the employee, or they can include incentives that are implied, uh, provided to the employer. Um, and uh, ongoing support really is the continuation of the kind of the case management process. And it's important that these services don't end when someone gets a job. So what we'll often see in, uh, in some community-based workforce programs is that the services for someone uh, are in place until that person actually gets the job. And then pretty much as soon as that person gets the job, that case is closed and we moved on to the next person who needs those services. But what we found out is that if without ongoing contact and support and follow-up, the same kind of problems that prevented people from getting a job in the first place can occur again. And those can be you know, issues of substance abuse or mental health or conflict in the home or a lot of different things that can make them less successful in being able to retain that job over time. So it's really important to have a mechanism in place that provides that long-term ongoing support where people can kind of be weaned off of that so that they can be stable in the job market and have some success. And then finally, the concept of upskilling, as we call it, which is really the distinction between having an entry-level job and having a career. 
And so in many cases, it's easy to find someone an entry-level job. But moving from one entry-level job to another entry-level job isn't really a way to promote family economic stability or well-being. You want to move someone out of those entry-level positions into management positions, into manufacturing positions, into some kind of career that can provide long-term stability and chances for advancement for a family. So those are the, the main components that you'll find both in the workforce strategy and in the toolkit online. And again, this has been a really incredibly short overview of that and encourage you to look at both of these resources for additional information. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Penny for a few uh, final comments. Thank you, Matt. Um, and as we move on, and just thinking about in a more of a global um, takeaway, as the slide says, um, many programs serve, and programs that we work with in the Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood programs, but it also community-based programs um, in general, they serve a low skill but a high need population. Um, and as I mentioned, including several um, of different uh, federally funded programs. And these programs have the potential to play an important role in the provision of effective economic stability and workforce development services. Um, as we mentioned earlier, particularly with H the Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood grants, the, um, the funding opportunities and their new grant awards have placed a very high focus on economic stability and workforce development activities. Um, this was the case the last time, as well as this time, for these, uh, for particularly the fatherhood grants, in which they had three authorized activities, one of which was specifically to do um, economic stability programming. To achieve the objective, organizations must be provided with information models and tools that are based on research validated approaches and tailored then to the individual organization. The toolkit and the strategy that we just provided is such a tool, um, and we hopefully um, will be able to provide additional resources and assistance to the new grantees on this, um, this tool and strategy as we move forward. Um, it's important to note that, that while the, the strategy is you know, pretty wide, re wide reaching and um, it, no one program is designed in a way that probably could, to, could do everything in, that, in this model. That's why, as Matt mentioned, partnering with other um, employers or other referral sources are, is extremely important um, throughout. The strategy is not built as a one organization do it all, but rather on a partnership, a partnership and referral component uh, being very important in that aspect. The, the workforce strategy is built on an extensive review and a refinement process, and it provides the framework for working with high-need, lesser-skilled populations. And I think earlier um, we discussed how it was based in the literature, it was based on um, individual uh, programs that we visited, and then um, finally vetted by experts um, in the field. Um, so that, is, again, builds built, built the framework for the, for the strategy. And it's also aligned with a new federal policy, which is a, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WEOA, if you will. And it aligns with the President Universal Community College propo proposal, which was highlighted in his most recent uh, State of the Union address. Um, and it targets the low-wage, low-skilled adults, which are many of whom are um, typical of the HMRF, or Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood programs. Um, I think we're going to finish up here with a with a quick uh, another poll, with asking you for your um, first and your primary reaction to this new strategy to the strategy that we've described here. Could it be applied and useful to the work that you do? Could it be applied with different clients? It's interesting, but not relevant to the work we do. And, or it could be the, applied to the bottom of bird cages. So as we're watching these um, come through, it looks like the majority of folks are, are indicating that it might be, could be applicable to the work that they're doing. That's great news. Um, 
as we mentioned, it, this, the, the tool and the strategy can be found on the HMRF website. I'm going to go ahead and click over to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Katarina for questions. But just as we mentioned, um, the um, uh, it can be found, and the, the website is, and I think it might be on a last slide for informational purposes, but it can be found at hmrf.hhs.acf.gov. So I'm going to turn this back over to Katarina for some questions. Um, please feel free to continue asking questions in the Q&A box on your screen. I might just make one more comment as we kind of transition into the questions, and that is the uh, the toolkit and the the framework really is designed to be a living document, and we don't expect that the, what we have now addresses every question that everyone's going to have about how to work with a, a low-skilled, high-need populations. Uh, and to that end, we're actually currently in the process of adding two modules to the toolkit. Uh, one is around specifically around employer engagement and how do organizations, nonprofits work with businesses uh, directly to kind of develop these partnerships to find opportunities um, for you know just, um, maybe uh, transitional supports and subsidized employment and those kinds of things. And so there, that's going to be coming out. And the second one is specifically dealing with how do you work with a, a incarcerated or a reentry population. Uh, because there's a lot of additional challenges that come along with working with people who have a history of incarceration, uh, in addition to making it more challenging to find a job at other organizations that you have to work with, particularly uh, if you start working with people while they're actually in the facility or coming out of the facility. So those are two additional modules that are being added probably sometime in the next few months uh, to the toolkit. So we'll continue to add additional resources uh, as we move along. I see a few questions. Do we want to have... Uh, does someone want to read one of the first questions? I think Katarina's going to step back in and, and do that. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Tony and Matt. Um, so as we started to jump into our question and answer session, again, you can submit your questions to presenters through the question and answer feature, which is at the bottom right of your screen. Or you can tweet at OPRE underscore SSRC using the SSRC webinar hashtag. And again, the tweets using the hashtag will display on the left side of your screen. So we had a few questions come in. The first one, does the toolkit include any sample tools, like assessments that a program could use, or good pre- and post-test to help show progress? The toolkit contains two different kinds of uh, resources. Uh, in each module, and one is uh, useful links um, or sources, resources that you can use. And so there are some uh, links to specific tools or resources for questions that you might want to ask. But there's also additional uh, uh, links to uh, resources that provide background information uh, or provide more in-depth reading on a particular topic. So for instance, if you're interested in uh, motivational interviewing, the module I think has several pages about motivational interviewing, but it also can direct you to other resources that you know have a lot more information if you want to go uh, more in depth or engage in you know a motivational interviewing process than you haven't had one before. So, thanks, Matt. This question has come in from Barb Garrett. In module number five, you mentioned upskilling. Can you please share examples of promising practices that actual healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood grantees have used to maintain contact with their clients over time? Uh, two, uh, well, I can, yes. So uh, there's several different ways that this can be done, and there's no one-size-fits-all approach um, for programs to use. Several different approaches that I'm familiar with, one include uh, programs that have an extended um, planned period of disengagement where uh, they would go, plan to keep people engaged in services or in contact with their case manager for six months or a year after out, and so that there are periods of regular follow-ups uh, that take place after that. Some people, uh, some sites have used, um, you know, technology to help them achieve those goals and uh, including, you know, as simple as using a spreadsheet and, and, a, and a calendar to, to to do that. And there are some other states, sites that are using more social media platform uh, types of technology 
to help keep people engaged, uh, both in kind of a community of peer support and as a way to stay engaged with their case managers or other providers to provide that kind of ongoing um, support that might be needed. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, this is Penny. I just want to jump in. I think it also really um, be, it can be determined by the program model that the uh, program might be implementing. Again, it could be part of an ongoing follow-up um, that um, that your agency and the case management approach that your agency is taking with this population as well. Yeah, and then finally, I think the there there is a distinction between the amount of time that a, a program or organization can invest in a single individual. Um, and, and how much time it might take to upskill someone in a particular um, uh, set of skills. And so uh, programs typically have a, a, a short duration of time where they can work with an individual. Um, and so upskilling someone may be difficult in that period if you want to get them through. You might be able to do something like truck driving school, but it's going to be much harder to get someone an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And so putting them on the pathway towards, you know, those kinds of longer-term advancements is also a, an equally important kind of avenue to explore, even if you won't be working with them, you know, by the time they get their bachelor's degree. So. Yeah, and, and finally, just when that said that, it made me think um, a lot of programs are now implementing, <coughs> excuse me, more like an alumni um, situation where they, you know, they, they do do outreach to um, current or and, and previous <coughs> participants to see how things are going um, because it's also very true that in these particular programs that it, even though um, an individual may be seeking a job and they may have you know, being placed in employment and then are continuing to strive with that employment, that they might also be still working with the program on other um, needs that they may have. Thank you both. Um, this is this question comes in about the research, and can you discuss a little more about the research that was conducted in building the framework and how it factored into the development of the toolkit? Sure, I'll try and address that, and Penny can, can back me up if I forget anything. But really, this process um, started with a basic understanding of trying to understand just what programs we're actually doing around uh, economic stability and workforce uh, development and, and how uh, programs, sh what they should be doing. And so based on those kinds of questions, the first step really was a, uh, an in-depth look at the literature across uh, numerous fields, and we actually did a, a put together a compendium of like a 178 page research document that had 30 separate authors uh, scanning, I think, 10 different fields of study to pull out all of the relevant information that we felt, you know, kind of address this basis. And so based on that um, uh, research review process, we developed a white paper which kind of outlined the, the framework and the model that we want to present. And that framework then was both field tested and vetted by experts in the field. We had a meeting in, in D.C. with the feds, with researchers, with programs, with experts around the country to all provide their feedback on that. And then we revised the model and then took that out back into the field for another series of, of testing to see how it held up to the reality of things. So, so that was the, the basis of that. And so the, the beginning process of the research was really that uh, intensive kind of compendium that we had developed that kind of covered the basis of all these things. So it was an extensive li literature search. Excellent. Thank you. This next question comes in from Kay Reed, who is curious about what specific content or approach or strength that a healthy marriage or responsible fatherhood practitioner would bring to the table that traditional workforce development agencies may not have experience with. Well, that's a, a um, great question. Oh, go ahead, Penny. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I'd like to, to just add, throw out um, my initial thoughts on that in that the piece that the, the, the programs, the healthy marriage uh, programs can bring is really in that client plan and case management approach. Um, in that capacity, your um, would be a program would be providing services and 
for the holistic, uh, more holistic approach for the individual rather than strictly a workforce development or workforce activities. For example, many of the men um, or women who come into to the HMRF programs, um, what they're coming in for is because you know they'll tell you, I need a job. Yes, you do need a job, but there's a lot of other issues that need to be addressed um, before you know you're going to make a good employee, if you will. So you know the, the marriage programs, these community-based programs, are able to to provide services such as you know maybe during an intake and assessment, a um, a substance abuse issue, or it's revealed that there's housing issues, or child support issues, or uh, mental health issues, or just general health issues that can be addressed and need to be addressed throughout um, so that you're not, just doing, you're not just doing that workforce piece. The other thing, when working with your employer partners, um, and I think Matt mentioned that we're going to have an, another module to this toolkit that is really working on how to work and engage an employer partner, is that the employers, when, when, you're, when you are re referring an individual to that employer, they are really you, you, they know that your program is providing them, them with the, the individuals with services to make them better employees. You're, you know, you're giving them those soft skills, if you will, um, and communication skills that are, is really going to be a benefit for the employer. Um, and then many times we found um, in talking to some of the different programs that are implementing similar strategies here, is that that employer will then reach back to your agency um, to see if you have any additional employees, uh, potential employees that when they are in need for employers. So I think the holistic approach is what um, these community-based programs are able to provide that a, a typical workforce strategy might not be able to. Matt? And I would just add a couple of things to that. Um, there are, uh, I think, a, a couple of things that make Healthy Marriage and Responsible Fatherhood programs specifically valuable partners in this process. And one, as, as Penny already alluded to, really is in the development of soft skills. Many of the programming curricula that are used are specifically designed to develop soft skills that are intended to improve family well-being. And so there are the issues of, of conflict resolution, uh, social skills, um, problem solving. And so those are things that are needed and are intrinsically taught as part of a marriage or relationship curriculum, as part of a parenting curriculum that um, also have direct transferability to kind of the workplace. And I think the other thing which is often overlooked is, you know, it's uh, the process of going from having a low-skilled, high-need person to working their way through the system is, is a lot of work and it's a very difficult thing to do. And it's really, I think, what many job programs have found that people aren't necessarily ready for that kind of change. Uh, and then they need to have some kind of motivation to do that. And the other thing that we've discovered along the way that, that Healthy Marriage Responsible Fatherhood programs are particularly good at is providing that, that, that motivation. And so people get into these programs because they want to do better for their family, because they want to have a better relationship with their spouse. And so that's the reason they're there in the first place. And that same motivation will take them through the program because achieving you know, greater economic stability is going to benefit their family, it's going to benefit their relationship. And the other thing that tried to that, and that's why I pulled up the conceptual process map here, is that we've found is that to be successful in this process, really at, at some fundamental level, is a process of personal transformation. You come out of these programs, out of this process, a different person than you were than you went in. It's not just a matter of learning a job skill and then you're going to be successful in the job market. It's really a matter of changing who I am at a, at a fundamental level that underpins particularly some of the very basic fatherhood programs. And that is, personal transformation has more impact on their long-term sustainability and to get and keep a job than any of the hard skills that are taught almost. And so those are two aspects that um, healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood programs are particularly good at and are why they're important to have as part of this entire social service uh, system of care. Great. Thank you. Uh, conversely, we had another question come in asking, how does this model work with non-marriage programs? I would say that you know, while the program model was developed specifically to look at how uh, healthy marriage or responsible fatherhood programs can fit into a system of care, it really, at its, its fundamental, had to first describe how a system of care should work. And so there are a lot of opportunities for 
programs who are interested in this population to find a piece of that puzzle that they feel like they're good at or that they want to be involved in. So I think the model is applicable to any kind of community. And so therefore, it can be very, as relevant to other kinds of providers, non-healthy marriage responsible fatherhood providers, who want to be involved in this work. And so you may say, well, what do I do in this model? Maybe I provide transportation, or maybe I do a specific job skill. But you have a role in the larger set of network providers. And the trick then is to find this network and to kind of help build a coordinated system of care. So. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we have uh, many more questions coming in, so I'll just keep going through them. Another one is, what suggestions do you have for healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood practitioners in approaching their local WIV to implement WIOA? Uh, might they refer individuals to HMR programs for soft skills, soft skills development and with disconnected youth? Penny, you want to try that one on first? Well, the, as, as it would happen, <laughs> this is actually a question that we've been asking ourselves uh, over the last few months, particularly since the new WIOA rules have come out. And to that end, we have actually engaged in a process uh, over the last few months of talking to some programs around the country about how they engage with their WIOA uh, and their workforce board. And so I, I don't know that I have the the correct answer at this point, although what we have found is that there are a lot of varieties. And in many cases, there's a real close relationship. In other places, there's not a good relationship at all. And that may have to do as much with what that workforce investment board in your area is, is focused on. Are they focused in on a low-skilled, high-need population, or are they moving in that direction? Or are they focused more on middle-class America and helping to get people back to work who had lost their job? And in, the, in those cases, there's not as much connection between uh, the workforce board and, and programs like this, but that's starting to change as well. And so the only advice I would say is that there, there is opportunity there, and you have to develop those personal relationships with those key stakeholders uh, in the workforce board or in the other areas to get into that system, or you have to, in many cases, develop kind of a, a parallel alternate system that addresses the needs of low-income individuals because the workforce system in your area is not doing that. I don't know. Penny, do you want to... Yeah, I, I would just yeah, I would just add to that that with Rioa in particular, there is an age um, component that. Um, but I would say that many of the marriage programs um, and fatherhood programs actually have an overlap there. So it is an opportunity with the Rioa to take that opportunity and to to, to build your build your relationship if there isn't already one. But I would I would tend to agree with Matt that the um, information that we've gathered thus far has been varied. If you will, it's every, everybody seems to be doing it a little bit different. Um, but um, you know, building that relationship, and um, there's also been at, at OFA in particular a, a focus on trying to work with um, TANF agencies and working, having the TANF agencies working with with their workforce um, folks as well. So I know that within states, and then that's also been an approach that OFA is aware of. Um, and, and just trying to implement that. So hopefully there will be some promising practices coming from that as well. That would be a benefit to you. Thanks. As a follow-up to this, can you elaborate more on how this model matches up with WIOA? Well, I think as we alluded to in the slides, uh, we've actually had uh, some of our colleagues do a step-by-step -step comparison of what is in the WIOA rules and regulations and goals and the workforce strategy. And they, work, they match up uh, very well. So I'm not saying there's a necessarily one-to-one -one correspondence, but all of the aspects that are in the workforce strategy are relevant and appropriate to the new rules that are coming out of WIOA and the majority of the rules and regulations that are uh, being put forth from WIOA in this process fit within the workforce strategy. So they're very complementary in that way. And so I think take, moving forward with this framework is a great way to start the process of uh, engaging with that, uh, that world if you are not already involved in it. So. Excellent. This question comes in from Stephen Pascal, who is asking, are there any suggestions for how programs not involved in workforce development can incorporate these strategies into their current services? Well, again, I, I would say, as a, as a first answer to that, is that um, being involved in 
uh, doing components of the workforce strategy does not necessarily require that you do anything differently. It was never the intent. The intent is to find that what you do well and then to partner those at skills, attributes, activities with others who are also doing different things that provide a complete picture. So I'm not sure what your services are, but I would say to take those services and to find where they fit into that larger set of service providers. And then what needs to happen is if you have a deficit in some particular area where uh, you know, someone's not providing the, the soft skills in a way that you need or, or who do, does a good job with resume building or connecting people to job services. If there are gaps, then I think then that provides opportunities for that network to say, you know, here's what we're doing and here's what we're doing well and here's what we're not doing. Maybe this is an area where I can move into, let's try to find some way to at least start providing these needed services or some way we can find some additional funding to do those kinds of things. So I think taking that kind of a strategic um, look at the, the services available and how you fit into those is probably the first step. Thank you. This next question comes in from Brenda Knighton. In module number five, you spoke about incentives for employees and or employers. And can you give examples of what that looks like for both? Sure. So incentives for employees would include, typically include um, retention incentives. And so, you know, if you are able to maintain employment for 30 days, for 60 days, for 90 days, then the participants are given some kind of a bonus. And this is particularly helpful for people who are just reentering the workforce or have challenges or need some kind of extra incentive to help them maintain. I would also say that to some degree, you know, the earned income tax credit falls into that category, that if you are, you are working individual but not making a lot of money, that the earned income tax credit is sort of an incentive to maintaining that work relationship. The other side of the coin is really incentives for employers, and I think that takes uh, many different shapes, you know, uh, along the lines of subsidized employment opportunities. So I'm, you may pay for half a person's salary for nine months, or you may have a graduated process. I've seen programs that pay an employee salary completely for a month and then half of their salary for the next month and then a quarter of the salary for the next month or not at all. And then some other programs have even a simpler strategy where they just provide a bonus to employers and say, if you maintain this person in your place for 90 days, we'll give you X amount of dollars for doing that. And and those obviously those many of those kinds of um, incentives we have, have shown been more effective with small employers than large employers where it's often more of a hassle to kind of implement that process. But if you have a small business that, you know, it has a very small profit line, the opportunity to make a few extra thousand dollars uh, can be a big incentive for them to, to hire and retain an employee. Thanks, Matt. This next question is regarding caseload. Is there, have you, what have you seen as an ideal effective caseload size? And is there a range for that? Uh, well, I'll try and answer that. I'm, I'm not necessarily think, expert yeah. on that. Maybe Penny can take a stab at that one. But do uh, you want to try that, Penny? Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not sure, and I think it would vary um, from place to place. Are you, are you, I'm, I'm assuming, Katerina, that they're asking from a case management perspective for a caseload, or, how, or could you, can you reiterate the question to make sure I understand? Sure. I believe it's from the case management perspective, um, if anyone would like to type in clarification. Um, but from a case management perspective, an ideal caseload size or a range for the target caseload size. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with it. It, really it yeah. does vary. And obviously, it, it should vary, of course, with the amount of services that you're providing. And so if you have mm -hmm. a, a, a service-rich case management process, where the case manager is actually providing a ton of services, you know, going to court hearings of people and providing them with transportation, you're going to be able to provide a lot less uh, than that of, of those kinds of services if, than if you're managing, you know, connecting people to different services and more of a, a referral type process, and you refer even internally to people who do the facilitation and teach the classes uh, and mm -hmm. provide those external ports, it's going to be lighter. But well, all I can say on that regard is that, you know, almost universally that when we go out, people often feel overwhelmed <laughs> in terms of being a case manager, but, but, but most often they still are able to be effective in that job, but they always feel overwhelmed, which I find interesting. So uh, I don't, I don't yeah. have an answer for that, but it, it's going to vary. So. 
Yeah, and I don't, I don't either, Matt. Um, but I, I would um, second what you just said that um, it, it does, it will, I think, depend upon the the level of service that the case manager can't, manager does provide individually. So yeah. But, uh, I, but I will say, yeah, if you go into the toolkit, I'm sure that there is a resource in there that would provide you the right answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, we, we uh, got some clarification um, for the question. Just an ex as an example, that in one county it's about 50 per case manager, and it varies from another county about to about 75 per case manager. So different variations. Yeah, um, we have another. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Katarina. I was just going to say, I think that's true um, county to county, state to state, city to city. So yeah, it's, um, or, in organization to organization, I think it just varies. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, Matt. I know that's a very nebulous question on that uh, and very nebulous answer. <laughs> um, uh, a couple more questions coming through. Again, back to the research from Kay Reed. And can you talk more about what research is available uh, correlating teaching relationship skills in the context of family and personal relationships and its tie and impacts to employment and soft skills? So can you talk more about the uh, research with those correlations? Uh, been about a year or so since I've looked at that <laughs> research. I'm a little fuzzy on it at this point. I do know that there is some of that research. Uh, I'm not, you know, it may not be a random controlled trial uh, gold studies, but there definitely is a, a research base on that. And if you wanted to send me or Penny a, an email, okay, or we can reach out to you, um, I'm sure we can dig that out of the compendium and send you, you know, the relevant um, resources that support that statement. So. And that's exactly what I was going to say, Matt. If you'd like, we can reach out um, with that information. Thank you so much. Um, and then to concluding a little bit more, can you highlight us once again where we can find the toolkit? Sure. I think it's on one of the very early slides. Um, it's at the website is uh, hmrf.acf.hhs.gov. One more. Right there. Um, there's that, that link right there will take you directly to, um, it, we, we named the actual toolkit itself is called Within Reach, Strategies for Improving Family Economic Stability. Okay, wonderful. And then again, you can also find that on the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. We have a link to that as well. Um, I believe we are just about at the end of our time, Melissa, unless there's any other concluding thoughts that have come through. But again, on your screen are the links for uh, where the toolkit is housed, either directly from the Office of Family Assistance Reference or through our Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. We have a link to it as well, where you can find this and additional research and resources. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can follow up with us as well. We will be posting these slides on the SSRC as well as these materials that you can follow up with. And again, you please feel free to reach out to the SSRC or the speakers and with any additional follow-up questions. So with that, I'd like to thank you, uh, Penny and Matt, for this presentation. And I'd like to thank all of our participants as well for all your questions. And again, encourage the conversation to continue. You can tweet at us and use the hashtag, and we will follow up with you or email us as well. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for thank your, you. Particip your participation.